Buenos dias. Good morning. I've exhausted my Spanish. Uh, so I apologize for speaking in English, but I want to thank you all for being here um, and to the organizers for inviting me to come and speak. Um, you probably look at the title of my talk and see the word data and think it's time to sleep. But I'm here to convince you first that data is interesting and exciting. But second, as the title says, the data will drive the healthcare revolution in the future. And to convince you of this, I'm going to start with a provocative statement. And the statement is one about data and science. I'm a scientist. I do cancer research. I study other diseases. If you invite me back next year, I'll be happy to tell you about the work I do rather than data. But I'm going to start with a provocative story about data, a provocative quote about data. Every revolution in the history of science from the Copernican heliocentric model to the rise of statistical and quantum mechanics, from Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection to the theory of the gene, has been driven by one and only one thing, and that's access to data. Data are the raw materials we use to build theories, they're what we use to falsify and test our theories, and they're what we use to develop new theories and new models. I like to quote famous scientists when I give presentations, and I looked for a quote like this and couldn't find one, so this is mine. <laughs> it's my intellectual selfie, and so um, you can use that freely. But data really does drive revolutions in science. And that's, if you learn nothing else from what I'm going to tell you, that's the single most important thing. If we think about health and biomedical research, uh, one of the things that's exciting to someone like me is we have access to unprecedented data. In my career, much of this started, much of my work started in 2001 with the publication of the sequence of the human genome. The genome is the collection of DNA in your cells and my cells. In that genome, there are elements that we call genes. And those genes encode the blueprints for making proteins. And your cells are little machines that are made of protein. So the DNA in our cells in fact, tells our cells how to make other cells. They tell our body how to make the cells that make us who we are. Now, as soon as I say that, you can start to think about, well, your body is made up of lots of different organs and tissues, lots of different cell types. And one of the amazing things we discover is that the same DNA is in each and every cell, but it's used differently. The genes are used differently and put together differently in all our different tissues to make them function the way they function. And in fact, healthy and diseased tissues essentially have the same DNA. And our challenge is to understand how those same parts get put together in ways that allow us to function normally or also cause some of our tissues to become diseased. The raw material that we use to try to address those questions comes from obtaining DNA sequence. Now, the first human genome, the collection of DNA in our cells, was sequenced in 2001. The estimate was in 2001 that it would cost 100 million US dollars to sequence the next genome. As a professor at Harvard, that's clearly something I can afford. No. Uh, but um, the cost today has dropped to about 1,000 US dollars, which means I can pay for it with my credit card. And that simple statement changes the way we think about generating data. We have access now to just unprecedented quantities of data. The challenge is to take that data and interpret it. If I were to sequence your genome today, even 20 years after the first genome, and I were to give you advice based on your DNA, it's likely that most of what I would be able to tell you is that you should eat well, exercise, maintain a healthy weight, and not smoke. Okay? You can give me $1,000 for that, I'd be happy. But what we really have with this DNA data is the raw material that we need to begin to ask questions. To answer those questions, we need other sources of data and information. And in the context of healthcare, we need things like patient data from hospitals about the state of your health. But we can also collect many other sources and types of data to really begin to understand not only disease and health, but how our lifestyle, how uh, the choices that we make, how uh, the things that we're exposed to influence the state of our health. So the challenge as we move forward 
is to really take this data and fulfill the promise of what we call precision medicine. Being able to look at our DNA sequence and estimate our risk of developing diseases. But once we develop diseases, to do a better job of detecting them early and then intervening in an intelligent way. Not treating everyone in the same way, but using our own individual data to decide on the best course of treatment for each and every patient, with the goal of ensuring that each one of us has a long, healthy, productive, good life. And so that's the challenge that I and my colleagues have been working with using data as the raw material. And as we start to think about how we implement this in ways that are going to have an impact on you and me and everyone we know, we've come to realize that if we're going to do this kind of precision medicine, customizing treatment for each patient based on their own unique disease and genetic makeup, that we need to collect appropriate types of data and think about data-driven precision medicine. And what that means is we have to think about developing uh, individual therapies that are targeted to unique genetic aspects of our diseases. So in cancer now, there are actually many different examples in breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, skin cancer, in which we can target specific mutations that exist in the tumor but not the rest of our bodies. And in other diseases like cystic fibrosis, we're developing therapies that target unique aspects of the genetic makeup of those individual diseases. But if we want to do this, we want to target the right therapy to the right individual. And so we've developed what we call companion diagnostics, biomarkers that let us match patients to therapies. And the amazing thing is, if we select the right therapy and treat the right patient, what we can see is a dramatic turnaround. So this is an image on the left showing a woman with metastatic melanoma. Her disease, her cancer, her skin cancer, is spread throughout her body, but it contains a mutation in a gene called BRAF. And if we use a drug that targets that mutation, what we can see on the right is an image of the same woman after the disease has essentially been eliminated from her body. Now, while these kinds of therapies hold tremendous promise, what we see is that many of these do not work perfectly. So these little pie chart charts show targeted therapies, and the red shows those individuals who don't respond, and the black shows the responders. Some of these drugs work exquisitely well if you carry the mutation. Others work only in people who have the mutation, but not everyone. So our challenge is to figure out who to give the drugs to and why certain individuals don't respond to these therapies. And in fact, all of our decision-making in medicine suffers from the need for more data. Cliff Huddis, who is the president of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, really summarized this well. He said, the majority of our decision nodes in treating patients are not defined by a high level of evidence. Your physician learned from his mentors, who learned from his mentors, who learned from his or her mentors. And the medical treatments that we receive are largely anecdotal. So how do we use data to drive this? Well, what we have to think about is really a solution that's driven by data. We realize we can generate things like genomic data, but we also recognize, as I mentioned earlier, that there are many other sources of data and information we need to collect to be able to interpret that data. But if we're going to build a system that's going to serve your needs and my needs and the needs of a hospital and our doctors, we have to recognize that there are many individuals who are part of this ecosystem that we want to try to work with and understand their needs. What you need as a patient is going to be slightly different, although close to what your physician needs to treat you but it's going to be very different from what a government official might need to make policy about what treatments should be used and when, or how to pay for treatments, or how to negotiate with the drug companies about the cost of therapy. And finally, we have to recognize there are a lot of data needs that we can address using modern technologies, but only if we use those technologies effectively and efficiently, and in a way that protects all of us and our privacy and our rights. So how would we do this? How do we derive value from the underlying data? Because just collecting data by itself is not enough. 
we need to think about using analytical tools to extract meaning from that data. And the challenge is that biology is not simple. You'll hear people tell you that you can take all this biomedical data and feed it into a machine learning algorithm. It will pop out answers that will tell our doctors how to treat us. And the truth is that's just not feasible. So there's a great example of a failure of this kind of approach. IBM Watson was sold as a tool in which you could feed in all knowledge about cancer and out would pop new therapies and new ways to treat patients that would work. And the bottom line is that this model didn't work. And there are two reasons. One is that even though we have large quantities of data, we don't have enough data. Your genome and my genome and everyone else's in this room is 99.9% .9 similar. But that one difference out of 1,000 means that you and I differ in 6 million individual units of DNA, individual bases. So if we look at the diversity of individuals in this room, we think about a genetic diversity that's huge compared to the number of patients that have actually been treated and huge compared to the number of possible outcomes and possible other types of data that we want to collect and integrate to arrive at the best decisions for therapy. So even though we have a lot of data, it's not enough. But second, we don't understand enough about how our biological systems work to actually derive the optimal therapies given the data we have. So what do we have to do? Well, the answer is we have to make an investment in research and data. So in the US, the National Research Council, part of the National Academies of Science, had a meeting in 2013 in which they brought together experts to ask about the challenges of working with data. And in analyzing large-scale data, they pointed out that the challenges associated with data go beyond the technical aspects, managing data, collecting it, integrating it, right? Healthcare data is big, but Google and Amazon and eBay and Facebook deal with more data every day than our healthcare systems. So we have a lot of data, but it's not massive. And handling that data, securing it, protecting it is feasible. The real challenge in meeting big data's opportunities is the development of rigorous quantitative and statistical methods. Because if we, failure, if we fail to account for this, we may end up with results that are at best not useful and harmful at worst. We can draw the wrong conclusions from data. It's not like Netflix saying, well, if you like this film, you might like this one. If your physician says, oh, you took that drug, you might want to take this one, you want more evidence than the fact that other people are also taking the same drug. You want your therapy tailored to you, which means what we need to do is invest in methods that are going to lead us to those conclusions and the solutions. So how do we do that? How do we build a precision medicine strategy? Well, I was asked to talk about this because Chile has an interest in building this kind of strategy on a national level. And to do this, what the government has to do is develop a strategy that understands the needs of all of the stakeholders, not just the needs of the policymakers and the government, not just the administrators at the hospital, not just the scientists like me who want to use your data to develop the next generation of drugs, not the physicians who want to treat you, but you as well. And we have to look at what all of these individuals in this ecosystem need. And as we do that and think about this problem, what we have to recognize is that as we're looking at the needs of the different stakeholders, our challenge is going to be to build a system, a technology platform, that's going to capture, integrate, and store all the diverse data we can collect in a secure way that protects your privacy, yet still allows you and your physician and everyone else to use the data effectively to advance the quality of healthcare. What that means is that coupled with this kind of investment is an investment in robust analytical methods. As a person in Chile, you want medical decisions to be based on the unique aspects of the population here, not a population in Asia or North America or Europe or Africa or anywhere else in the world. The best care for an individual in this room is going to, be is going to come from analyzing data 
generated by all of the people in this room and all of the people across this country. And that's the challenge we have to encourage people to meet, to invest in the kind of research that's going to deliver the optimal care to everyone here. Finally, what one has to do is create a flexible system that serves your needs, the needs of your doctors, the needs of your physicians, in such a way that you can demonstrate or the system can demonstrate its value early on. The only way a government is going to pay for a system like this is if we can show there's benefits in terms of cost, outcome, and quality of life. And so the best way to do that is to start with examples where we know we can be successful. But at the end of the day, while data will drive the future of healthcare, the most important thing we have to remember is that success demands that we keep you and everyone around you, the patients that we want to treat, central to the development of the systems we want to deploy. So thank you very much for having me here. I hope you found that interesting and provocative, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.